Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we're going to start our next unit, and this will be on the biology of mind, mainly how do our biological systems interact with our psychology. So you might be asking, Mr. Becker, this isn't biology class, this is psychology class. Why do we have to learn biology? Well, after uh, about a century of research, it turns out that much of our psychology is based in the brain. So in studying what goes on in the brain and how it interacts with the rest of the body, we can get a better handle on psychology in general. So just a quick overview of what we're going to be going through in this chapter in general. Um, today we're going to be looking at the building blocks of the mind, uh, namely neurons, and how they communicate via neurotransmitters. Uh, tomorrow we'll look at systems that build the mind, functions of the parts of the nervous system, and then we'll look at the supporting player, the slower communicating endocrine system, which has to do with all these hormones that you teenagers in particular are pumped full of right now. And then, of course, the star of the show, the brain and its structures. So, back in the 1800s, there was this guy, Franz Gall, and he came up with this, well, now we regard it as this wacky sort of pseudo-scientific practice. And he called it phrenology. So this is the study of bumps on the skull and their relationship to mental abilities and character traits. So he would feel around on your skull, and if you had a bump right there, that would mean something specific. If you had a bump over here, that would mean something specific. Um, after a while, this got sort of debunked, and people knew that it was kind of um, crap. <laughs> for lack of a better word. But the important thing to take away from this is that uh, Gall had inklings of a major idea in psychology today, namely that the brain is specialized. It has different compartments that are responsible for different um, functions. So it's the localization of function. Today's search for the biology of self, uh, we call that biological psychology. So this includes neuroscience, how the brain works, behavior genetics, neuropsychology, and evolutionary psychology, how human psychology has sort of changed and adapted over time. And all of these subspecialties explore different aspects of how the nature of mind and behavior is rooted in our biological heritage. So how do genes play into a factor? Um, how does specialization play into it? Damage to the brain, how does that work? How does conditioning play into this? So we're looking at how biology affects the way that we think and how our mind works. So the study that we're going to look at today um, is called the atoms of the mind, namely neurons. So study this image very carefully because this is important to our unit. This is neurons and how neurons communicate with one another. This is the structure of a neuron. So here, this is the cell body. This is where all the action is happening. This is the main neuron. Now, the neuron, as you can see, has this little cell body right here. And these guys, these little like uh, tendrils, I guess you could call them tentacles, these are called the dendrites. This is what receives messages from other cells. So they're like hands. They sort of grasp and pull things in to the cell body. Um, however, when they want to send a message out, it goes through this sausage-looking thing. This is the axon. So this passes the messages away from the cell body over here to other neurons, muscles or glands. So this is how information is sent, through this sausage-looking thing. And what's sent over it is called the neural impulse, or the action potential. This is the signal traveling down the axon. Um, now, if we're going to go a little further with our sausage metaphor, the axon you could look at as the sausage itself, the meat, and this myelin sheath, this is the sausage casing. So this covers the axon of some neurons and helps speed the neural impulses. Now, after the neural impulse goes through the axon, um, it goes through these terminal branches of the axon. And these, these little guys right here, reach out to these on another neuron, and this is how communication happens. So this axon potential, this impulse, uh, travels down the axon like a wave. You've all seen the wave 
in uh, sports stadiums where one person goes like that and then the next person and then the next person. Well, think of uh, action potential in that sense. Visualize the wave when you think of action potential. It's not something going like that, but it's um, in the same way as the wave, it flows to the right in a stadium, even though people only move up and down. A wave moves down an axon, although it only is only made up of ion exchanges moving in and out. So the positive goes in, the negative goes out, and it just sort of waves itself down. And the direction of, neural, of their neural impulse is towards the axon terminals, away from the cell body towards the um, dendrites of another neuron. So the axon terminals link up with the dendrites of another neuron. So when does the cell send the action potential? When does it know how to do that? Well, when it reaches a threshold. So the neuron receives signals from other neurons. And remember, we have billions of neurons. So some are telling it to fire, some are telling it not to fire. The threshold is reached when there are more neurons telling it to fire than ones that are telling it not to fire. So when it reaches a critical mass and there's more neurons telling it to fire, that's when it fires. And when the threshold is reached, the, actual, the action potential starts moving. Like a gun, it either fires or it doesn't. More stimulation does nothing. This is known as the all or none response. It either fires or it doesn't. There's no in-between. So how do neurons communicate with one another? The action potential travels down the axon from the cell body to the terminal branches, as you've seen, and the signal is translated, transmitted to another cell. However, the message must find a way to cross a gap between the cells. As we'll see in the next slide, this gap is called the synapse. So if you look right here, there is a little gap between the dendrites and the axon terminal. And this little gap is called the synapse, or also known as the synaptic junction or the synaptic, synaptic, synaptic gap. There we go. And this is, as I said, the junction between the axon tip of the sending neuron and the dendrite or cell of the body of the receiving neuron. So as we see here, what happens is this axon potential travels down, and these neurotransmitters are sort of excreted, and this acts as the communicator between the dendrite and the axon, axon terminal. So the receptor site receives these neurotransmitters and acts as a communication. So these neurotransmitters, they're basically chemicals that are used to send the signal across this synaptic gap. And each receiving neuron has these receptor sites. And these neurotransmitters are received there. However, not all of them are used. Uh, the brain is obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but the brain is pretty sustainable, it turns out. Uh, we recycle neurotransmitters that are not used. And this is called reuptake. So ones that aren't used basically go back up and are used again. So all of this together, basically, you can follow the image right here. Sending neuron sends the action potential down through the axon terminal. It reaches the other dendrites that are receiving it. And this just keeps going on and on. And remember, this is happening in a split second. And it's happening right now as you're listening to this. So let's just follow it. The electrical impulses travel down a neuron's axon until reaching a tiny junction known as the synapse right there. These neurotransmitters um, are released, and these molecules cross the synaptic gap and bind to the receptor sites on the receiving neuron. This allows electrically par charged particle atoms to enter the receiving neuron and excite or inhibit a new action potential. So this third phase right here the sending neuron normally reabsorbs excess neurotransmitter molecules, a process called reuptake. So there are different neurotransmitters. There's lots of them, but these are the main ones. Serotonin affects mood, hunger, sleep, and arousal. Undersupply of this can lead to uh, depression, and that's why some antidepressant drugs raise serotonin levels in an effort to make you less depressed. Dopamine influences movement, learning, attention, and emotion. And the reason we know this is um, if you look at, if you study someone who has Parkinson's, they're unable to move, but they're also unable to pay attention or learn at the same time. So dopamine affects all of those. Acetylcholine, this 
enables muscle action, learning, and memory. So um, these these ACH producing neurons deteriorate as Alzheimer disease progresses. Uh, norepinephrine this helps controls alertness and arousal. An undersupply can depress mood and cause ADHD-like attention problems. This GABA, the gamma amidobutric acid, this is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter. An undersupply is linked to seizures, tremors, and insomnia. And the last one is glutamate, a major excitatory, excitatory neurotransmitter. It's involved in memory. Oversupply can overstimulate the brain, producing migraines or seizures. And this is why some people are really sensitive to MSG, because it contains a lot of glutamate, and it oversupplies them, producing migraines or seizures. So it turns out that we have different pathways for these different neurotransmitters. We have serotonin pathways over here, which are networks of neurons that communicate with serotonin, and they help regulate your mood. In the same way, these dopamine pathways um, they communicate with dopamine and are involved in focusing attention and controlling movement. So how do neurotransmitters activate the receptors? It's like a lock and key as you can see here, like a jigsaw puzzle. When the key fits, the site is opened. So the neurotransmitter molecule has a mo molecular structure that precisely fits the, re with the receptor site on the receiving neuron, much like a key fits the block. If it fits, then the signal is able to fire. If it doesn't fit, it's not able to fire. So we have what's called agonist and antagonist molecules. An agonist molecule fills the receptor site and activates it, acting like the neurotransmitter, so it mimics the neurotransmitter. In the opposite way, the antagonist blocks the neurotransmitter. It fills the lock so that the neurotransmitter cannot get in and activate the receptor site. So these are two ways, and the way to remember this is when you think of an antagonist in a story or a movie, they're the guy who goes against the main character. So if we think as, you think of the neurotransmitter as the main character, this antagonist is blocking him. He's opposing the neurotransmitter. All right, so that's all we have for today. Uh, tomorrow we will pick up again with the nervous system. Have a wonderful night.